If you don't mind, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. Uh, I know uh, many of you may be disappointed. We are going through the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, but that is something Brother Steve has been praying on and working on, and so I do not want to jump in and try to uh, work on that while he is not here because God has given him a very specific vision uh, for going through 1 Corinthians. And so what we are going to be doing, uh, we are going to be looking over the next uh, two Sundays, we are going to be looking at the four instances contained in the Gospels that have to do with Jesus calling disciples. We know that there are 12 disciples that are ultimately chosen uh, by Jesus to be his close inner circle, but there are actually four instances in Scripture calls them. And so I, I think that it is very important that we know who it is we claim to follow if we claim to be a follower of Christ. And not only that, I think it's very important that if we are that disciple of Christ, as we're all called to be, that we in turn are looking around and trying to make more disciples for Christ. Because you know in Matthew 28, that is the Great Commission, is it not? To go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, preaching, teaching, all those things. And then Jesus even gives us that beautiful, beautiful promise that he will never leave us. And he will never forsake us. So that is where we are. We are in Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. This is where he calls his very first disciples. And let's go ahead and read. It says, on one occasion... While the crowd was pressing in on him, him being Jesus, uh, to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of uh, Gennesaret, or maybe even Galilee, some of your translations say, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. And so getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Well, Master, we have toiled all night, and we have taken nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And so when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats, so that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw this, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees and he said, Depart from me, O Lord, because I am a sinful man. I am a broken man. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and they followed him. And all God's people said, Amen. This is probably one of the most preached, one of the most favorite sermons of all those who like to talk about discipleship. This is, this is at its very heart, the very core of what it means to be a disciple, what it means to follow Jesus, and what it means to be called up in the call. To go and make other disciples, more who are going to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And it is at the very heart of what the kingdom of God is. You, if you've ever read the Gospels, you hear about the kingdom of the Lord, the coming of the Lord, the day of the Lord, uh, the kingdom of God, the day of God. All these things have to do with Jesus arriving on the scene and echoing what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And foretelling of what will happen in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. Where it says, all the law hinges on loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And loving others as you would be loved. That is the initiation of the kingdom of God, people. That is what we are called to proclaim. It is what Jesus spoke most about. And it is ultimately what the disciples will figure out in this story. And so this morning we're going to be talking about what it means to be full of wonder and what does worthiness really look like. What does it mean to be awestruck, to be a fully grown man, to be a fully grown woman, someone who's experienced the highs and the lows of life, someone who's been there, done that, they've got the t-shirt, they've got the broken bones to prove it, that they've been there, they have the scars, they have the experience, they even have because of all they've been through. 
And yet in an instant, to have all of that shaken. In one moment, everything you thought you knew is turned upside down. And all you can do is simply look up and see the face of Jesus and say, You are worthy. That's what we've just seen happen in Luke chapter 5. And one of the beautiful things we learn about Jesus, this is very early on in his ministry, people. If we were to look in Luke chapter 4, we would see that Jesus is baptized. He goes into the wilderness. He's tempted for 40 days. He withstands and kicks out Satan from his presence. And not only that, he begins preaching in the synagogues with no disciples, with no fanfare. He just shows up to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and begins to preach. And even the Pharisees and Sadducees are amazed. And at that point, he goes out to the synagogue, and throughout the week, he heals. He preaches to the common people, which was something that was not common back then. And then he even goes to the house of one Simon Peter and heals his mother-in-law. And then later on, he goes and preaches and preaches until he is exhausted, because Jesus was and is totally God, and at that point, he was also totally man. And so at the end of chapter 4, we see where Jesus pulls away and he tries to leave the area. He's trying to leave around the Sea of Galilee, the area that he grew up in. And at one point, the people stop him and say, No, we want to hear more about this God. We need to hear more about your teaching. We want to see more healed. We want to see greater things than this. Please stay. Don't leave. And Jesus utters must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well because it was for this purpose that I have been sent. And that's in chapter 4, verse 43. And so now we catch Jesus early in the morning. He's trying to slip away from the crowds after he has rested, after he has spent much time sharing about the gospel and preaching the kingdom of God and healing and teaching, all these different things. He's trying to leave. And yet what happens? People show up. You know, I once heard a very great man say, you know what, life would be a whole lot easier if it wasn't for people. You know? But the problem is, people get in your way, don't they? Whether you're trying to get to work on time, because maybe you overslept, or maybe you lingered too long at the bacon. I don't know what you did, but you're behind, and all of a sudden someone turns in front of you, and you're like, you start trying to break out some American Sign Language, okay? It's wrong. But not only that, Sometimes we say, if that person, if my boss would just let me run things. Or, you know what, if my spouse would just live with me. Man, if my kids would only do that. And then there's that morning, that guy or that girl that you see staring back at you in the mirror. And you say, if you would just do this. If only you could be like that. There are a lot of times in our life we do look at people and say, man, if it wasn't for people, life would be easy. But you see one beautiful thing here. In verses 1 through 3. After Jesus has already declared his purpose. After Jesus has already said. I must go to proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet in the very earliest hours of the morning. When he is on his way out. To the next city. He is surrounded. By. People. And what does the Lord of all creation say? What does the one who the host of heaven. Wait on him with bated breath. What. What does the author and the finisher of all creation do when he's stopped by people? Does he obliterate them? Does he throw them away and say, I told you guys last night, I need a break. I got to go over there because this is what I'm supposed to be about. No. No. Even though he's trying to leave the area, when a crowd forms around him begging to hear about his father. Jesus doesn't just leave. Jesus does not just leave this crowd. You see, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, something very similar to this happens. Jesus has been preaching all day and he's trying to get away. And yet, when the people swarm him, he said, the scripture tells us that his heart was torn. The Savior. The one who had never felt need, the one who had never felt hurt, the one who had never cried before in all his life, all of a sudden his heart was torn in two because it says he looked out on all the people 
and he realized they were like a crowd of sheep without a shepherd. You see, I don't know if you know this about Jesus. I don't know if you've ever heard this about the Lord that we serve. He loves people. He loves people. Broken people, tall people, short people, calorically enhanced people, people with less hair than others. It doesn't matter. Jesus loves all of you. And for some crazy reason, he loves all of me. Even in John chapter 4, when we meet someone of a different race, a different race, a different country, a different social standing, a different sex, a Samaritan woman at the well, he doesn't leave her. In fact, she keeps trying to get him to leave while arguing politics, while arguing religion. Until he finally says, if you knew who I was, you wouldn't be trying to get rid of me. Because I am the one who's been sent to you. Listen, this is beautiful, beautiful stuff. Right here in the earliest time of the day, which is probably your least gracious time of the day. Can I get an amen? At least till you have that third cup of coffee. You know what I'm saying? Nobody mess with you till you add your coffee. Or maybe your bacon, whatever it is that makes you wake up in the morning. At this point, Jesus, he's so caught up in his mission that he says, I can't go yet. I've got to preach. I can't stop. I've got to love on these people. I can't leave them. I will be here for them. And what does it say? While the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God as he was standing by the lake, he saw two boats by the lake. And the fishermen had gone out of them, and they were washing their nets. So get this. Normally they'd fish at night, right? Because that's really good. That's why you guys wake up at 3 a.m. and wake up the whole household and you know, get out quiet, but you can't get out quiet. And anyway, you go fishing before it's even fishing time. I, listen, I don't know that much about fishing. Daylight seems like a good time to me. Because when it's dark, I fall in the water. And when I fall in the water, it's not fun. But you guys, y'all... Early and you go out in the dark, you know you got to get to a fishing spot at a certain time. And you know that the fish are going to wake up hungry. Well, listen, these fishermen are professional fishermen. They've got multiple boats, they've got multiple guys, multiple nets, they've got their own mini fishing company going on. And right now, they've been fishing all night, haven't caught a thing. They might almost have caught something because it says they're cleaning and mending their nets. So they are out there stretching them out on racks, they're retying them, trying to fix them. And then they look up. Specifically, Peter, the oldest one of them, the one who owns most of the stuff, looks up and sees a guy crawling into his boat. And he's like, oh, no, he didn't. I mean, let's just think about this, guys, ladies. Let's say you're coming out of Walmart. You see someone climbing into your vehicle. What is your first thought? I should go talk with him. He must really need that car. <laughs> no, no. We see Simon Peter, he looks up, he sees Jesus, followed by a bunch of people, and he's like, he's about to jack my boat. I mean, let's just be very serious. At this moment, Peter is exhausted, and he is tired. He's frustrated because he has no income to go home with. He has no food to feed his family with. His mother-in-law is just recovering from a horrible, horrible disease, and he's thinking, how are we going to survive? And then all of a sudden he hears footsteps. All of a sudden he hears murmuring. All of a sudden he hears a loud voice crying out. And he looks up and he sees a man surrounded by probably hundreds of people standing in his boat. And he says, well, I'm going to go check this out. We're going to handle this quickly. And as he goes up and sees the Lord who has promised to never leave us, Matthew 28, verse 20. He will never leave us or forsake us. And just as he never leaves this crowd wanting more, he is ready to share with them the very heart of the gospel, that God loves them. He has climbed into Peter's boat. And we see in verses 4 through 7 that not only does he never leave us, but he also exceeds our experience and our expectations. Listen. Simon walks up, and just as he is about to probably let the king of kings and lord of lords have it, okay? What is it that happens? He got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and he asked Simon to get out a little bit from the land. And so he said to him, 
down and taught the people from the boat. You see, you might be wondering, well, why all of a sudden is there this change in Simon? Because, listen, if someone was in Stewart's vehicle, he'd be a little worried. He'd probably be a little angry. He'd probably be a little frustrated. Just be real. But remember what happened in chapter 4. Simon sees this crowd. He elbows his way through the crowd. He gets to his boat, and he finds the very man who healed his mother in You know, this isn't the first time Jesus has met Peter. In fact, all the four stories that we are going to look at where Jesus calls his disciples, there is never a time where Jesus seems to call them the first time he met them. We're going to look at Levi tonight. Guess what? It's on the second time that Jesus met Levi that he says, come and follow me. This is the second time Jesus has met Peter. And he's going to eventually tell him, leave everything behind and follow me. When he meets Nathaniel, he's going to talk about, we've met before, brother. And now we're going to have a serious discussion. You see, many of you may be thinking, I've heard this kind of stuff before. I've been in churches like this. I've heard music like that. I've come just so I can make mom happy. I've come so I can get my wife or my spouse or my kids off my back because they like their teacher or they like the free cookies and Kool-Aid that's coming at 11 a.m. Whatever the case may be, you might be thinking that this stuff will not work on me. This gospel, this Bible, this Jesus, I've heard it all before. Guess what? You're no different than anyone else in here. You are no different than anyone else in here. If we were very honest, if we were really honest in here this morning, just about every man, woman, and child who is now a son or daughter of the king would admit that at some point in their life they looked Jesus square in the face and said, don't need him, don't want him. He doesn't measure up to who I think he should be. Because you see, I am who I am, and I've done what I've done. And I'm the boss in the shipyard because I've been there and done those things. Or I am the one who rules my home because I know how this goes and how that goes and I'm in charge. Or maybe I'm the one with the plan that is going to fix everything. But you see here, Simon is in very much the same boat ha, ha, as you and I are. If you were to look later in the scripture, we find that Simon Peter is the oldest out of all the disciples. Okay? In the book of John, we see that when they go into the temple, they have to pay a temple tax. And only two people pay the temple tax, Peter and Jesus. That means everyone else who's in the disciple gang is 17 years of age or younger. So youth, if you think Jesus isn't calling you, you're wrong. Okay, 11 out of the first 12 were all around your age. And folks, if you're thinking you're waiting until you're good enough to where Jesus can call you, you're wrong. So we see Peter. He's the oldest. He's the one who probably owns most of the boats, most of the nets. Also, that's why when he says, hey, y'all need to help me with these fish, everybody jumps in their boats, paddles out there, and helps with the fish because he has the experience. If you were to look for the best fisherman around the Sea of Galilee, Peter would be your guy. He's the one done that he's waded through all the storms he's come out alive he's brought home the biggest catches he's the one who seems to have all the answers and know exactly how why else do you think when Jesus shows up and says hey now that we've got the preaching done and now that the crowds have left I tell you what why don't you let your nets down but don't let them around here in the shallows where you always fish let's go out into the deep And Peter says, well, uh, you know, master, I don't know if you know this, but we've been working all night. That's why we were over there fixing our nets. That's why we look and smell the way we do. Uh, And and we didn't catch anything. We, We went to our best spots. We went at the best times with the best people around, and we caught nothing. But, because you tell us to, because of your word, I'll go over there and I'll drop the nets. Peter is probably saying, man, 
I'm ready to get home. I, I know this guy healed my mother-in-law, so I owe him. I'm going to take care of this, and then i got to go home and figure out what I'm going to do. And yet, what happens? Does this Jesus exceed all of Simon Peter's expectations? Yes. Does this man, who's probably never been on a fishing boat before, we never see any other time where Jesus has been on a fishing boat, so let's assume this is his first time fishing. He's telling the most experienced guy on the lake where to catch the fish and how to catch the fish. Does Jesus' lordship totally trump Peter's experience? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. In fact, they catch so many fish that he starts waving to the guys on the shore, the Zebedee brothers. He's like, guys, we need another boat. It's like that Jaws moment. We need a bigger boat. He's like, no, we need more boats. We need more people. We are in trouble. We are going to sink. All these fish are going to get away. We need some help. To where the other guys throw their nets in the boat, paddle out there. They come and help grab all the nets up. They're fishing in the deep, so they can't even see all the fish. They can't even see the nets themselves. They just know that the boats are starting to tip over. And after that happens, after that happens, Peter simply falls down to his knees and looks up at his Savior. You see, there are moments in life where we realize Jesus knows way more about us than we know. And not just who we are, but how we got there. And not just our so our future, where we're going. And maybe you think that's crazy. Maybe you think, nah, listen, we all make our own destiny. We do our own thing. As long as I work hard, this will work out. As long as I try hard, this will go. There are plenty of people in here, some with a lot of gray hair and some with no hair, who will tell you, just because you try hard doesn't mean it's always going to work. And just because you think you're right doesn't always mean you are right. We often feel like we're in control of everything. That we have a plan. If we just work that plan, and if everyone will just get out of our way or fall in line, it's all going to work out. But I want to ask you this question. I love to listen to teenagers. It's so much fun. You can ask them who their favorite team is. They get all passionate. You ask them about a certain guy or girl, and they get real quiet. Um, you could ask them about a video game, and they won't stop. Have you ever sat and listened to a 16-year-old tell you how their life's going to play out? It's fun. It's fun. I've got more quarterbacks going to the NFL than you can think of, you know? i got more people who think that they are going to cure cancer by age 21 than you can think of. And not saying any of those aspirations are bad. But how many of us, if we were to look at our 18-year-old self, would laugh at them? And say, you think this is the man for you. You think this is the woman for you. You think this is your plan. You think this is what you want. You think this is the prayer you want answered. You think that this is the worst thing that's ever happened to you. You think this is the best thing that's ever happened to you. But wait till you meet Jesus. Because he changes everything. It's at this moment that Peter figures out he's totally out of his depths. He knew Jesus was a healer because he watched him heal his mother-in-law in chapter 4. He knew Jesus was a very great speaker. He seemed to have the charisma. He seemed to have the word of God. He seemed to have the anointing of God. But who knew that he could beat Peter at his own game? At this point, Peter now knows that this guy's totally than anyone or anything he's ever come across. And it changes everything with Peter. And why does Peter fall down in verse 8 and say, Depart from me, O Lord, because I am a sinful man? It's because he's realized that not only does Jesus exceed our expectations and our experience, but he shakes our sin and he shakes ourself. Ten minutes ago, Peter knew how the world worked. He knew that if he, went and if he went and fished in this place at this time, he was going to catch fish. He knew that if he worked hard, he'd feed his family. He knew that if he just did 
did what he had been taught to do as a small child by his own father, that everything would ultimately work out. He knew how to succeed. He knew where he belonged. He knew his place. But now there's only two things he's sure of. And the first thing is he's sure of his sinfulness and insufficiency. He realizes that he himself is not enough to deal with all that life throws at him. Do you realize you're not enough to handle everything this life throws at you? Listen, I got two little girls. I know I'm not enough. Every day they bring me so much joy. And at night when I kiss them on their forehead, pray over them, and they go to sleep, I go sit on the couch and I say, Lord, how am I to be a father to them? And if you were honest, you've thought those same thoughts. You've had those same prayers saying, God, how am I to love my wife? How am I to love my husband? How am I to be the guy at the job site who can get things done when I might be just as confused as they are? Life very quickly can show us how messed up we are and how little we really know. But not only does Peter realize his own sinfulness for doubting Jesus, his own insufficiency for not being able to handle the situation, but also he realizes Jesus' sovereignty. Peter has finally found something he can't handle. Peter has finally found something that he can't manage. And listen, my question to you this morning, have you found Jesus Because here's a clue. If your God fits in a box, then that's no God. Jesus breaks past all barriers. Barriers of politics, barriers of race. All these things that we love to hold up to say this person fits over here and this thing goes over there. Jesus blows past all of that. And Peter now realizes it. The very one that he has grown up hearing about on the Sabbath morning. When he heard those old gray-headed guys talk about the Savior, when his mom would tell him about the one who was going to come and change the world, when he and other kids would whisper about the guy who's larger than life and he's going to change everything, maybe one day he'll show up. The one that Peter's always heard whispers about is now proclaiming the kingdom of God directly in front of him. What about you? When you come face to face with Jesus, what do we do? Sometimes we harden our heart and say, thanks, but no thanks. I don't need you, don't want you. Sometimes we say, well, Jesus, just hold on. I got a lot of stuff I got to do by the time I'm 35. Then after that, I can get this whole religious thing down. Or maybe we get a little scared because Jesus is more than we can handle. And he calls for more of us than we might want to give. Peter feels a little helpless because his sin disqualifies him from even being around Jesus. Maybe that's something you've felt. Jesus, you don't understand who I am, what I've done, what I've had done to me. I've got so many scars, mental, physical, emotional. You really don't want to get mixed up in this. And yet, and yet, out of all the hundreds and thousands who have followed Jesus for the last week, Who does Jesus call to be his? Verse 10, don't be afraid. Because from now on, you will be catching men. The one who finds himself totally broken, totally confused, totally convicted of his own sin and mess ups. The one who didn't even want to go do what Jesus had asked him to just a few minutes earlier. The one laying down in his own boat, crying, saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This is the one whom Jesus has called. The very last thing we're going to talk about is when we see Jesus reach out of hand, when we see Jesus issue a call to follow him. There's like this three-step part of it. Number one, you're called. Number two, you're caught. You're caught up in this call of Jesus. And number three, you start doing the catching. You know, I went fishing the other day uh, with Cameron and Terry Snow. 
and they are just fun, okay? If you know the Snows, they're just some of the best people in the world. They're funny, and they're great to hang out with. Well, listen, they've got way more experience than me with fishing, and it was proven by they were catching fish. I didn't catch a thing. Did not catch a thing. And I come loaded for bear, brother. I brought all three fishing poles that I own, okay? And I had all this fishing tackle. And, you know, Terry was very gracious. He, he's running a charter fishing business. Uh, and he said, well, Brother Dustin, he said, I think, uh, I don't think those lures are going to work. And I said, well, what do you mean, Mr. Terry? I said, these are the ones I catch all kind of stuff on. He said, yeah, but we're not fishing for bass. We're not fishing for brim. We're in the Gulf little different. And I said, oh, okay. I said, well, what do you think I should use? You know, I'm trying to be the, the, the nice, gracious person. Like, what do you think I should do? And he said, well, I tell you what, I have all these lures. Why don't you try this one, this one, and this one? And I said, okay, I'll do that. Two hours later, I still hadn't changed my lures out. They're pulling in fish after fish, and I'm still using the same stuff I brought. Because for some reason, I figured because I have an XY chromosome, because I am a man, that I knew what the fish wanted. I ain't got no clue. I didn't even know what the legal limits were for the fish. You know, I'm sitting there like, oh, we should totally keep that and eat that. And he's like, yeah, you're definitely from Louisiana. That's not legal. We can't keep that. I'm like, oh, okay. You know. But you see here that when we meet Jesus, when he grabs hold of he grabs us and he says, listen, you might have been going that way, but that's the wrong way. You might have thought you were the master of your domain, but you're really not. You may think you have everything under control, but really you're in the middle of a storm. And I, the one who have been promised, the one who has come to save you, I am now grabbing hold of you. And I am calling you to follow me. And so now you have a choice. Now you have a decision. Are you going to admit your own sin? This is Jesus speaking to us people, every one of us. Are you going to admit to your own sin? And admit that you need me more than you've ever needed anyone or anything in your whole life. And if we follow just as Peter did, if we fall down on our knees and say... I am a sinful person, my Lord, my God. When that happens, we are caught by the Master. We're not just called, but we answer the call. And at that moment, we're instantly saved, instantly changed. You don't immediately know all the verses in the Bible by heart. You don't immediately know how to be the perfect husband, perfect spouse, perfect son, perfect daughter. You don't immediately show up in a three-piece suit to a church. Because that's not what it means to be saved. What it means to be saved is that all of you is now put into the hand of Jesus. And that Satan himself, John chapter 10, can't snatch you out of his hand. And that from then on, we now have a new purpose. And it's the one that's mentioned by God and his people in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And it's the one echoed in Matthew chapter 6 when Jesus shows up and begins preaching. Is that we're to love God and love people. All that God has taught you. Listen, many of you, you, you grew up in the South. You've had a drug problem ever since you were kids. You've been drugged back and forth to church so many times you can't keep count. All that experience, all the scars, all the good and bad that's happened to you in your life. It finds its rightful place in Jesus Christ. What you have experienced, all that you've learned, all that you've done, and all that you've been brought through. God himself has taught you that, has built that into us. And a lot of that he saved us from, amen? Now it is to be given over to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords for his calling, for his purpose. Peter has spent his whole life learning how to be a leader of men, how to be the best he could be, how to do the most he could with what he was given. And now that's why Jesus has called him so that he won't only catch fish, but that he 
will catch men. And that's what Jesus is looking for. That is who Christ is calling this morning. Someone who's so called up in their call that they can't help but bring others over so that they may be part of this adventure. You notice that, that Peter doesn't try to be the big man. He doesn't say, I got this, I got this, and then he falls into the Sea of Galilee with his massive catch. No, he looks over to his friends and says, y'all got to come see this. Y'all have got to be a part of this. And even though Jesus issues this call to Simon, James and John are right there beside him in the next boat, listening and seeing everything that's happening. And what does it say they do in verse 11? When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and they followed him. Jesus, we uh, say thank you this morning.